So I have titled this The Legal Significance of OpenStack. I couldn't really think of a, of a better title. Uh, I wasn't really sure what to talk about um, when, when uh, Alice and uh, Eileen were kind enough to invite me to speak on this legal track. I really <laughs> like um, participating in legal tracks at technical conferences. I think that's really an important uh, thing to have, and, I, and I'm very pleased to see this happening. Uh, so uh, when I was trying to think about what to talk about, I, I, I realized that um, I've been giving you know talks at mostly tech conferences for, for a few years now, and um, uh, they've been on various subjects, and I realized there was sort of a common theme, and I realized that uh, the common theme had to do with the, basically I would say the relationship between corporations, corporate participants in open source projects, and communities, and, and the, the idea of software freedom, and there's a sort of tension there, and uh, that, that, that uh, I hadn't really kind of thought of that before, but I, I think that's sort of a common theme that's been um, at the heart of a lot of the interesting policy and legal issues that I have been looking at in open source ever since, well, really ever since joining Red Hat. Uh, so oh, this is not, not an official um, you know, Red Hat talk. If you want to learn about Red Hat's relationship with, with OpenStack, <laughs> I recommend talking to Perry Myers or stopping in the Red Hat booth. Um, so, so this is just you know, my personal thoughts. And, and you, you'll probably disagree with, with a lot of what I say. Um, so um, Eileen already said basically since, and, and this is, you can, this is how you can contact me if you want. Um, so at Red Hat, I, um, I kind of have a, a broad set of responsibilities and they kind of expand over time, but I mostly focus in the area of open source and uh, also increasingly standards. And that's, you know, partially by, by, by choice because uh, it's, it's what interests me the most. And it's also um, kind of expertise. I guess I'm the subject matter expert in the Red Hat legal department on open source. And open source, of course, is very important for Red Hat and has been throughout its, its uh, history. So uh, I thought I'd, I'd start out with a, a quote. And, and the one I initially thought of doing was, uh, actually, I remember when Rick Clark said on the OpenStack uh, mailing list, uh, what was it? I, I, I truly hate all this legal stuff or something like that. But, but because there actually isn't like, all, this talk isn't really about legal stuff per se in, in, in a sense. Uh, I thought I would get, instead use this uh, very recent quote from uh, Lydia at um, Gartner. And, and this, this was sort of seen as this kind of anti-open stack kind of FUD uh, quote. She, um, she says that, you know, there, there are people who have been misled into thinking that, that open stack, because it's open source, uh, it must be an open and widely adopted standard uh, with broad interoperability and freedom from commercial interest. And th this is sort of an, an odd statement because anyone familiar with open source would know that, you know, many, you know, the most important open source projects do certainly have uh, commercial interests uh, behind them. Uh, on the other hand, there is a big difference between an, an open source project and an open standard. And I think Jonathan Bryce has, or, or someone associated with the OpenStack uh, Foundation and the project had, had a response to her points and I think pointed out that, well, in a sense, what, what OpenStack wants to be is, a, is to become a kind of de facto standard. Um, it isn't, you know, it's different from, a, from, a, from an existing standard. Um, so she says, um, in reality, OpenStack is dominated by commercial interests. Uh, it, is, it is a business strategy for the vendors involved, and it's not the effort of a community of altruistic individual contributors. And th this is an interesting statement because um, it assumes that, um, I don't know if this is her view or, or the view that she's, she thinks uh, people being misled may have, but, but um, it assumes that there's an opposition between being an altruistic uh, individual contributor to a participatory project is somehow in conflict with there being a lot of commercial interest behind a project. And um, so that seems to, to kind of reflect a misconception about open source, and maybe an out-of-date one, but there's also something something true to it. And it, it kind of uh, got me thinking that this is related to that common theme that I've been seeing over the past several years. So, so um, I, I believe that um, we've we're in this period now, you know, for about five years that's in open source that, that is different from the preceding period. And I think uh, it's hard to see this happening, you know, when it, at the time. But I think looking back, we see uh, certain, certain things that have happened that wouldn't have happened in the previous era. So this is, in the slide, uh, I, I sort of set out, you know, how I kind of visualize or, or, or conceptualize the history of, of open source in a very kind of high level way. So, so open source, open source, long before it was actually called open source or even free software starts out uh, in this kind of prehistorical era 
um, before the 1980s, uh, you had elite groups of um, programmers who were uh, naturally sharing code with one another across institutions, usually universities and uh, uh, research divisions of, of uh, uh, big industrial companies, hardware companies usually. And uh, this was a period in which um, that kind of collaboration was uh, what I call a-commercial. wasn't I wouldn't say non-commercial because that has certain connotations today, but it was it was assumed that software was not a commercial thing. It wasn't seen as an asset. This was a time before um, software was was seen as a form of property that um, that existing intellectual property law clearly applied to. I mean, I suppose trade secret law was the was uh, the one that sort of seemed to be the most applicable. But um, you know, this for a long period of time, it wasn't clear that copyright applied to to software. Certainly, patents were assumed not to apply to software. This is kind of a U.S. perspective, but it's certainly true of the, the rest of the world as well. And that came to an end gradually uh, during the the 1970s, the end of the 1970s, uh, with uh, in the U.S. certainly with some changes in the law and in other countries as well, um, but also some business changes. So there was a a, uh, a process of what I think was called um, unbundling occurring in the, in the software industry at the time. Uh, so, so the first soft commercial software uh, ventures emerged in the, in the late 70s. And it was, it was sort of uh, realized that you could have a business, a viable business um, around software that wasn't coupled to hardware. So this was something that, that gradually happened with some legal and business changes. And when that happened, that caused um, a reaction among uh, developer communities uh, that I think really led to what we now think of as, as the open source um, culture that is behind all the, the, the various open source projects we have. So, so this was the, basically in the 1980s, we had this early era where, where it's now basically developers uh, who come out of this software sharing culture are trying to reconcile themselves to the fact that that law applies to software and, and they have various views about this. Some of them are very hostile to this. Some of them uh, see opportunities um, some of them see that, that sharing of code uh, in a kind of public domain sort of fashion across institutions, as they had been doing, could be the basis for uh, a downstream commercial ecosystem. So sort of a standard, a standard setting like uh, a view of um, uh, what we would now call open source software. And I think that OpenStack kind of descends from that, uh, that part of um, open source culture. This is when I think of the, you know, that period in, you know, long ago in the 1980s, something like the the um, maybe the X window project that MIT started is, is is something similar. So that you know they were using using very permissive license, one of the earliest open source licenses or free software licenses, um, very close to a public domain dedication. Um, but this was also the period when uh, there were other viewpoints. Um, th there were there were some developers who thought that um, commercialization was basically the enemy, and and, and these developers really kind of you know we, we think of as open source today uh, doesn't really include that part of the, the, the culture. It, it still exists, so there, there is a kind of non-commercial commons, of, if you will, I think, uh, um, for example, often around gaming software, but, but this is not part of open source as we, as we came to know it. But the, um, the, the other view that was very influential was the copyleft view, the one that um, Richard Stallman championed. So, so Richard Stallman uh, saw an ethical problem with the rise of proprietary software, the proprietary software industry, and um, he developed uh, a concept that he called copyleft, which uh, was basically a, a way of using software licensing to try to preserve the free status. You can think of it as trying to kind of perpetuate the public domain status that um, software in his world had had years before. And so we, we looked through that era, and there was this debate over these two different approaches to licensing, because licensing was, was now being used by these communities. Uh, uh, they had basically adopted the legal techniques of the, the um, uh, commercial proprietary companies and, and found ways of using using licenses to to fulfill their policy objectives, which was very different. Uh, so that's sort of the 1980s, and then in the 1990s, this sort of flourishes into this flourishes into this um, uh, explosion of um, uh, community projects like like Linux and Linux kernel project, like the Linux distributions, uh, like the Apache web server project. Just many, 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 many projects. Uh, emerge in that time. It was sort of a golden era of, um, of free software as it was more commonly known then. And uh, the next period begins in, in 1998 and, and this I, I would call the open source business bubble. So at, at that point uh, open source is named open source for the first time and it's, sort of, it's marketed to business people, entrepreneurs, 
uh, CIOs, and it, it becomes visible in a way in, that it hadn't before. And, and there's this uh, exploration of, um, of different kinds of business models around around uh, open source that begins at that time and lasts uh, several years. And this is a very strange era. This is the, the, the era, I mean, at the end of this era, I, I got started in doing legal work in, in this era, uh, area. And uh, so I have a kind of an, an odd take on it. I, 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 um, I was initially very kind of attracted to it because, because of the sort of um, uh, enth business enthusiasm around it. Um, but um, I think that, be that came to an end around 2007, 2008, and I think we're, we're living in this, this different period now. I, I think it's sort of non-controversial that, that that open source bubble burst at some point around 2007, 2008 or so. Uh, and I, I think, um, so, you know, for, for uh, all but that very first prehistorical period, there's always been this tension in open source or free software as it, as it was previously known between, um, you know, the idea of software freedom, which is fundamental to the, the kind of licensing models and, um, and cultural norms uh, that, that these developers and these projects had, and commercialization, because the, the common quality of, um, you know, what both copyleft and non-copyleft licensing was a belief that commercialization was a right. There, there were different takes on on whether commercialization should be restricted and, and how much. But commercialization was, was a goal of both of these camps. And, uh, but at the same time, there was always this, um, in a sense, this natural tension between, between commercial interests getting involved in projects and, and the communities that develop the stuff. So I think it's been a common theme. But what, what's interesting about the bubble period is I think that some of these themes were suppressed in a sense. They were sort of swept under the rug. And I think what has been happening in the past five years or so is that these issues have come up again and they're being discussed uh, more openly than they had been during that period of sort of irrational enthusiasm that, that uh, preceded the current period. So I'm just going to, to talk about like some of the themes I, uh, I see in uh, you know, having come up in the past several years. W one that, that really sticks out in my mind, although we don't talk about it as much today, but was big around 2009, 2010, is uh, this this debate over open core and this kind of real kind of um, vocal backlash by many people involved on the kind of uh, policy side of open source against what was called open core. So open core, uh, it, it was a term that, that quickly sort of lost meaning, but it, it, it generally meant um, a business model in which a company would have a, a an open source license community edition, often um, with kind of crippled features and then would would make money by selling a more featureful um, proprietary version. So it was uh, the latest of a kind of series of experimentations in basically proprietary software business models that had an open source element to it. Uh, so the earlier forms were sort of more simple dual licensing open source and proprietary business models like um, MySQL was most famous for. But so open core was a, sort of a variant of that. And that, that uh, that in a sense was, was becoming more popular around this time. And there was a big ba backlash in, in um, uh, developer communities against this, and I was quite struck by that. And, and I realized that, that OpenStack really comes out of that period, right? So um, it, it really originates in this in a way that I actually had not, uh, I'm not sure I had really um, appreciated so much until kind of looking back and, and seeing, uh, you know, kind of reading again about the origins of OpenStack. Um, you know, it, it's, I, I think it's kind of well known that, um, Part of the origin of OpenStack had to do with uh, the frustrations that um, Chris Kemp and, the, and his uh, collaborators at, at NASA felt in, in trying to contribute code to Eucalyptus, which had one of these open core models. It had, a, kind of, I think, a GPLv3 licensed open source version and then a, 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 uh, a, a sort of premium version that was proprietary. And they, they tried to submit patches to improve Eucalyptus, and those patches were, were rejected because they they would have enhanced the open source version, which was going against the kind of basic premise of the, the model. And um, when OpenStack is launched as a project, uh, this is something that I, I just found out recently, uh, or at least, or perhaps I had forgotten about it, but there was a document that, that the project, uh, I guess, I assume Rackspace and NASA worked on together, and, and it's still um, available on the OpenStack uh, 
website today, and it's called What Does Openness Mean? And it's kind of a, it's as much of a political manifesto as any, as, you know, Richard Stallman's GNU manifesto from the 1980s. It's a very, very interesting document, and I think probably one of the most important um, legal policy documents that's been written in open source over the past, um, uh, well, pr re probably ever. It's a very, very significant document. And one of the, the points made in this document is, is this pledge that OpenStack will not be open core. So I think um, um, this, this backlash against open core is uh, a, a key part of the origin of, of OpenStack. This um, pledge to not use a, a model like Eucalyptus um, was using or that, that uh, what was then cloud.com was using, a sort of a similar approach. Uh, that that um, OpenStack would be a pure open source project. It wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, feature any kinds of gimmicks in which um, the open source version, there would be a, a crippled open source version and then a for sale, um, more featureful version. It would be a collaborative open source project. Uh, so, so, so another theme, and all these themes are kind of, it's hard to kind of separate them. They're all very closely, closely related, at least in, in my mind. Uh, something that's been talked about um, a lot more recently, and, and uh, Alice and Eileen um, uh, re referred to this, is this is a sh the perception of a shift away from GPL licensing, which I think had, had in, I guess, in at least the popular mind, long dominated uh, uh, the view of what, you know, open source licensing was mainly about and towards more permissive licensing. And, and I've been giving a number of talks on this subject over the past year because it's so so interesting to me to, to, um, to kind of explore whether there's really any kind of shift going on. And we don't really, we don't really know. And that's why I have the question mark next to this. I have no idea whether there's a general shift away from the GPL or copyleft towards towards non-copyleft permissive licenses like the Apache license. But, but I, I think I see a shift going on to some degree in some, you know, in some context. And what I definitely see is that newer corporate initiated projects, and, and OpenStack is probably a good example of this, in the past several years, have tended to be under um, permissive licenses, whether the, often the Apache license, um, sometimes a DSD license or the MIT license. But, but I, I definitely see a trend there. Uh, you know, I don't have the data to prove this, but, but I, I, projects that I would have expected to be under GPL, you know, going back prior to 2007 or 2008, these are the kinds of projects that I'm seeing companies use permissive licenses with. I think there are, you know, probably many reasons for this. Um, and, you know, the, um, Alice and Eileen talked about the, you know, why OpenStack chose the Apache license and, and, uh, and, and the fact that the Apache license is actually so fundamental to a project that it's baked into the bylaws, into the IP policy such that you would, re you would need a super majority to, to make any change to it. So it's really a kind of fundamental constitutional piece of, uh, of OpenStack's IP, IP policy, um, uh, more so than, than um, probably um, most projects that are now associated with the foundation. Uh, so it's a very uh, important feature of, of uh, OpenStack. So why does OpenStack use the Apache license? Well, um, I mean, the answer that, that, that uh, is maybe the most obvious one is the one that Alice and Eileen talked about, which is that, you know, this is, this license would encourage the, the broadest adoption of the technology, which was an obvious goal of the project. And that's, I'm sure that that was the, you know, a main goal. But I, I have to think that, that part of it was also this, this um, part of this was related to this backlash against open core. So the open core models were based on copy left, uh, open core as I define it at least. And um, these models and you know, dual licensing in general have kind of experienced this fall from grace during this period. I think it fell into disrepute. It, uh, as I said, you know, this, I think this was a long simmering resentment against this, this kind of business model that I think came to be openly discussed during this period. And, and uh, that, that criticism came out in the open. And I think that that must have had something to do with any tendency we are seeing today t towards um, the use of permissive licenses instead of copy left licenses like a GPL. So I think that that probably had something to do with it, especially when you consider the kind of open core, anti-open core related origins of OpenStack as a project. And I think, um, you know, why would this be so? I think it's, it's because, I mean, my intuition is that, that when, a, when you have a corporation starting a project, the way Rackspace had basically started OpenStack, you, you want to, um, if you want broad adoption, if you want to, to, to really build a community, and not all projects, not all corporate, corporate initiated projects have that goal, but if you want to build a community, you want to, um, you, want, you need to build trust among the participants. And, and I think at this point, um, 
for many, um, both corporate participants and maybe individual participants, the GPL and copyleft licenses had gotten a bit tainted by the example of some companies that had uh, that were seen as having misused it. And so, so permissive licensing, like the Apache license, has the um, effect of signaling trust uh, by a corporation. It's um, you know it's basically giving up much more power than a uh, a corporation launching a project under the GPL and then maintaining very tight IP control over it so that, uh, so that uh, you know, an open core type or dual licensing business model can be pursued. So uh, this, this idea that permissive licensing signals trust is, uh, is at least my intuition, uh, part of what is going on in, in any shift of um, licensing trends that is going on. So um, you know, using the Apache license is a form of giving up power in a way that you would not, you know, GPL obviously gives up power to some degree. But, but uh, using a permissive license gives up much more power because it gives every recipient of the software the right to proprietize it, much just as the, the uh, initiator of the project would to proprietize it. Uh, so uh, another um, uh, theme of this period is what I've recently called license insufficiency, this perception that um, you know, historically there was this view that, that um, you know, what you need for software freedom is, is an open source license that has all the features of an open source license that gives you the right to fork and gives you all the freedoms associated with open source. And there, there is this emerging view that this is actually not good enough, that, that you need um, some kind of commitment to transparency and open development. And, and um, uh, th th this has been talked about quite a bit over the past few years. Um, you know, it, it's, it's approached uh, a, a um, uh, sort of a, a suggestion that maybe our definitions of open source should be revised to take this into account. I talked about this a little bit at my talk at LinuxCon a few months ago. And this is um, something that also makes us think of, of OpenStack because OpenStack from the beginning has really had this dedication to, to openness in its development model. So the open design and, and collaborative development, um, this emphasis on meritocracy sort of um, um, I think you know Apache style meritocracy, but 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 this, these have been key features of the project from the beginning. They're even emphasized in that that um, that manifesto document that I referred to earlier, uh, and they continue to be a feature of OpenStack. So, um, but the thing is, this is this didn't um, this didn't eliminate all of the concerns within the OpenStack project about uh, the existence of imbalances of power, because this was a this was a rack space managed uh, project and. And uh, that was, uh, you know, one of the motivations, of course, for forming the foundation. But but even even now in this post foundation formation era, I see some of these concerns still existing. You know, I, I I'm I'm on the the uh, OpenStack Foundation mailing list, so I kind of detect. I don't know if that's kind of representative of, of any particular viewpoints, but I detect some of this this um, concern about about power relationships <laughs> still persisting. But this was certainly true for a long amount of time, and it was one of the motivations for um, starting the. Uh, process of moving the project from rack space to foundation structure. Uh, again, uh, you know, related to these other themes is this um, this idea that there's a problem with um, uh, a fundamental problem with single entity control of projects. So this was this is obviously related to the, the open the concern about open core. Uh, this is sort of related to the the concern about misuse of the GPL or other copyleft licenses and maybe the, the idea that permissive licenses are ways of building trust. Uh, so, sure. Yeah, and that, that can be an issue and, and actually, so, you know, so this is not, this is not a new, um, uh, observation at all because uh, at the very dawn of what we uh, of, the, of the actual open source revolution, you know, in 1999, Jamie Zawinski, who was uh, in his famous uh, another famous document, uh, his his resignation letter from Netscape, he uh, he he had the famous statement, you know, open source is not magic pixie dust. And what he was actually talking about in this uh, in this document is he said, you know, you know he had such hopes for for uh, the you know the Mozilla web browser as it existed at the time. This this open source project that Netscape had, had launched. But at the end of a year, it was still really completely controlled by Netscape. And that is not something that he had anticipated. He thought that it would become a very collaborative project, 
in which Netscape would just become one of many uh, participants, and that did not happen. And he saw that as a, as a failure. And but this was, um, you know, that, th this was maybe the end of that 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 uh, pre uh, business bubble period. So so it, it, this this concern, you know, wasn't talked about very much during the subsequent years. But I think this is this is more um, this has been more a, a concern that's been expressed in the open in the past several years. Um, and OpenStack is is one example of where it's come up. So so there was, um, you know, in the in the very short uh, but exciting uh, rapid growth of OpenStack as a project, the concern about Rackspace uh, Rackspace's dominance of the project was uh, voiced by many people. It was certainly a concern inside Red Hat. It, it uh, uh, you know, for Red Hat, it it kind of delayed our um, entry into the project, at least as as, as I perceive it. There was a there was a concern that if Red Hat got involved, we would not be uh, treated as uh, you know an equal participant uh, on a meritocratic basis. And and Red Hat had had that experience with some other uh, open source projects in the past. So so there was some, some you know history there that Red Hat did not want to kind of repeat certain past mistakes. And at the same time, you know Red Hat itself had been on the other side. I mean, many of the projects that Red Hat had, had initiated, the open source projects. Uh, remained and you know remain to this day kind of dominated by by Red Hat. So I think this you know, looking at OpenStack actually had a very good effect on Red Hat. I think because Red Hat realized you know it wasn't really so different from what it was criticizing. And um, uh, but at any rate, so you know OpenStack didn't really have this problem of uh, lack of magic pixie dust. It very much had mag magic pixie dust, right? Be because uh, the project grew very rapidly. It attracted a lot of participants. But still, this this concern about control by Rackspace persisted, and, and was one of the motivations for the tr uh, transition to the foundation structure. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I think this was actually addressed a little bit by um, by Alice and Eileen. But there's, uh, you know, one aspect of, of why why single entity control is a problem. You know, I mean, part of it is that if you want to get, if you believe that the open source development model actually has software engineering benefits, and you're not going to get those benefits if there isn't diverse um, participation, right? I mean, that's sort of an orthodox belief, at least for, for large-scale projects. I mean, it may, may not be as significant for small projects, which tend not to have large contributor communities by definition. But for big projects, it's really kind of obvious when there is one entity that's kind of controlling things, uh, or at least has unequal power relative to sort of external participants. Uh, and I think you know part of this is is this idea that um, you know what happens if if the company controlling the project uh, is acquired. This was something that I think Alice may have mentioned. Uh, what what happens? Uh, will the project die if that happens? I mean, this is this is uh, really kind of a property rights theory. Uh, uh, so you know the concern is that um, you need for, for property to be secure, you need to know that it's going to be around. And um, if there's one company that has too much control over a project, sort of ironically, that's actually a danger sign because it may mean that it's more likely that the project will disappear if that company ends its commitment or disappears or becomes acquired by some other company. I mean, I, we've seen some examples of this. Uh, and I think um, Rackspace um, had this, must have had this epiphany that, that they wanted um, OpenStack to succeed. And in order to, to make it succeed, they had to give up some power, and this is very difficult, you know, for for companies to do. I mean, I've seen this, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in many ways, I see Rackspace as kind of mirror image of Red Hat because we've we've dealt with this at Red Hat as well. You know, we we um, we start so many open source projects, but I think we're we're often afraid of naturally afraid of giving up um, control. And I think uh, the experience with with getting involved in OpenStack, as I've said, has been very valuable for Red Hat because it 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 has allowed Red Hat to kind of confront this on some level. You know. I think we're we're um, we're improving because of that. Um, so so Rackspace realized, and I think um, Lou Mormon actually said this uh, uh, at some point that th their goal was to make sure that Rack that um, OpenStack could survive without Rackspace. That if Rackspace disappeared, this project would continue to be successful. Um, so another uh, uh, thing that was a, a a common theme during this period, re and, and really not so relevant to to OpenStack is. Controversies around contributor agreements sort of erupted in the in the open, and and, and I get, used to give uh, actually recently gave a talk on on this uh, when I was in, at OWF in Paris. But I've talked about this in the past, and there's always been a controversial issue in, in open source developer communities, and it all again it relates to this problem of you know, uh, w you know the, of, of having a single entity. So the beneficiary of a contributor agreement will um, generally be seen as having 
uh, receiving power from external contributors to the product. So you have this imbalance of power. Uh, I mean, this was often a criticism of the FSF, actually, and, and still is, uh, but, but later on became even more of a problem for corporate-dominated open source projects. Uh, but it's really not an issue for, for OpenStack. I mean, I don't see any, so OpenStack uses the, the um, Apache-style CLAs, and uh, I think the only people who really criticized uh, uh, this were me and Mark McLaughlin. Uh, so, 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 uh, so I, I think I think most OpenStack participants are, are comfortable with this. So, so I think in this sense, you know, you know, Mark and I are, are, are the progressives, and and um, you know, but but it's not it's not really um, such a big deal because because uh, I think I think these contributor agreements that give you know formally give power to this inbound entity, whether it's you know rack space or a, or a or, or a neutral foundation, they're not so problematic when the outbound licensing of a project is, is permissive license because there's really not a lot of distance between the Apache CLA and the Apache license. So it doesn't raise the same kinds of issues that say using the Apache CLA would have if you had a GPL license project. That would be closer to copyright assignment, which uh, uh, is you know very controversial among uh, in open source communities. So um, you know, in, in a sense, it's not really surprising that this wouldn't have been a big issue for, for OpenStack or, or, or a controversial issue as far as I can tell. I mean, I have heard some, some complaints about um, the, the red tape involved in, in CLAs, but um, you know, I, I don't think that there's been that much of a fundamental policy objection to it from OpenStack participants. Uh, so uh, another uh, theme of this period, and, and I think uh, probably the last thing I wanted to talk about is that the, the um, you know the whole idea of, of having a foundation be the the home for a project. I mean, this is this is not a, a new idea at all. You know the Free Software Foundation was founded in 1985. The the Apache Software Foundation goes back to I think uh, 2000 or so. Uh, the the goals of a foundation changed during this period, though I believe. Uh, so um, if you think back to why the Apache Software found, uh, Foundation was formed, uh, I mean apocryphally it was that. Uh, an IBM executive said, I can't make a deal with a web server. So it was just sort of this, this desire to have some formality around what were otherwise loose, loosely affiliated groups of developers. And so that uh, to facilitate commercial participation, you needed some kind of more formal structure. And that's, that's you know, still a, an important part of a, a function that a foundation could serve for a project that's associated with it. But I think what, um, what happened in this period that wasn't really true um, in the past was the idea of foundations as neutral um, neutral territory for multi-participatory, um, you know, multi-vendor participatory projects. That, that um, this is sort of the identity that the Apache Software Foundation took on during this period that I don't think it really had in the early years of its existence. I mean, the Apache Foundation actually was sort of tainted by some of its associations with, with uh, particular companies, right? Uh, and I mean, that, that still exists to some degree, and 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 and, and that's a that's a problem with with uh, a number of open source related foundations, but I think what what we've seen in this more recent period is this, this uh, very kind of um, frank observation that that foundations, you know, if they serve any really valuable role, it's to to provide this this neutral playing ground for so that you know that um, um, you know at least formally speaking, participants will be treated equally, especially important for corporate participants in a in an open source project. Uh, and it's also part. Of, it's also related to this concern I, I already spoke of, which is the, the problem of you know what happens if the, the corporate founder goes away. So a foundation is sort of seen as maybe a, a kind of permanent home for a project. That that uh, corporations may be acquired and, and may change their priorities. They may give up on projects, but but um, a foundation is a more of a, a longer seen as a more, a more longer lasting uh, kind of home for a project. So so there was a, an essay by uh, Henrik Ingo a couple of years ago that talked about this and. He um, attempted to show that that um, you know most of the most successful um, open source projects had foundations closely associated with them, and and I think there, I, I disagree with some of his um, methodology, but I think there's it's an interesting point that that um, that he was saying that for vendors who start projects, if they want the projects to succeed, they really should um, cease kind of uh, formal control over the project and and try to move their project to association with a neutral foundation, because that's experience has shown that, that a foundation, uh, a neutral foundation is with good governance is likely to, to um, uh, ensure the survival and success of the project. 
uh, you know, this is this is not. I mean, the the idea of neutral foundations is is um, you know sort of questionable because you can have corporate influence, uh, undue corporate influence over foundations that's not transparent. So there's there, there's there's you know, my views on on foundations have kind of shifted back and forth because of this concern that I've had that there can be kind of hidden uh, corporate interests that that uh, are behind supposedly neutral foundations that are not really disclosed. Uh, but this wasn't really uh, an issue with the Open Stock Foundation, which is sort of the last, I think, the last slide I have, uh, or the second to last slide. The, the Open Stock Foundation um, is very interesting because it, it, um, it, in a sense, addressed a lot of these concerns in, in, uh, in the way it was set up. So, so it, it, this sort of tripartite class structure was a reflection of, um, or an attempt to accommodate the different interest groups, commercial and and otherwise, that already had been forming around the project. So you had well-established companies, you had startups, and you had developers who were active in the projects. Uh, you know, generally working for these companies, but but in a sense, very much free agents. You know, uh, these are the kinds of talented developers that can uh, easily move from company to company. So you have these different interests, and these were accommodated in the in this three-part um, class structure of the. Of the foundation and its board, uh, there were you know safeguards against um, the you know so-called stacking of board members that were built into the, the foundation bylaws, and this was uh, again to address the, the problem of um, uh, undue control by by any one company. Uh, there's you know a sort of elaborate separation of powers between the technical committee, which uh, uh, you know works in a kind of in a kind of meritocratic fashion to control the technical uh, operation of the project from the uh, from the foundation board which which runs the um, you know the promotional aspects and the IP management aspects of a project so so this kind of separation of powers is very very unique um, and innovative structure I think uh, it didn't really have much much precedent uh, uh, you know a little bit maybe like uh, the Eclipse Foundation and you know there was a that was a case where IBM uh, basically gave up power itself and 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 uh, Evolved Eclipse from a project to a kind of multi-vendor participatory foundation, but I, I think it, much more so than Eclipse. Um, I mean, it's a little too soon to say, but I think OpenStack Foundation um, embodies a lot of efforts to to address these kinds of concerns about about um, inequalities or imbalances of power, and um, you know the 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 diversity of corporate involvement and the the, the fact that it's under the Apache license is very relevant because it. Because it's uh, you know it's it's relatively easy to fork a commercially licensed project, especially if, if participation is is diversified. If you don't have talent that is concentrated in one in one company, so so the um, you know there is this kind of um, uh, tension between the, the technical committee, in a sense, of, tension is not the right word, but sort of uh, uh, balancing of, of interest between the technical committee and the, the board that I think is key to. To how I think the, the the foundation is going to be successful, uh, so there have been concerns that I've observed, at least on, on the on the foundation mailing list, about about uh, 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 you know aspects of how the foundation has been operating. So there there were concerns about transparency or lack of transparency by the board. Uh, there were some concerns about the the way individual membership. You know, so so, so uh, actually at Red Hat we, we were kind of critical of the open open endedness of. Uh, criteria for individual membership. We had some concerns about that, but I understood that why Rackspace felt this was very important, and um, in the end, I didn't really have a have a problem with it. But but I think we're seeing um, sort of belatedly some uh, uh, developers who participate in OpenStack expressing some concerns about this because they're concerned about you know I guess the, the, the issue is that statistics have shown that that um, employees. Uh, of uh, particular companies tend to vote for their own representatives in the in the board elections, and um, you know I'll, I'll reveal that I, I actually allocate most of my votes for Mark, so so I'm as guilty of this. I, I'm an individual member of the, the OpenStack Foundation, so 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 I'm guilty of this myself, and I didn't think I was doing anything um, nefarious in, in in that. But I understand the, the view. But the, the important thing here is is the is actually the you know not not that these concerns exist, but the fact that they're being discussed so openly. You know, when in a previous period. This would have not happened on a mailing list, you know. I don't, you know. I, I've often thought that, you know, you know how the Apache Foundation says that if it doesn't happen on a mailing list, it doesn't happen. I've often thought that um, there are probably many conversations that have hap that have occurred around the Apache Foundation that probably should have taken place in mailing lists. And so I think that that uh, 
uh, it's very healthy that, that OpenStack uh, uh, has this culture where these kinds of grievances or, or, or criticisms can be aired very openly and can potentially lead to reform. And so uh, just to conclude, um, you know, so what I've been saying is that I, I, I think that um, the past, in the past five years there's been um, a lot of very, very open exploration of, uh, you know, what is the role of corporate participants in projects. Uh, what, about, there's been an open exploration of the, the problem of excessive single entity control over projects. And OpenStack is, is a product of this era. It comes out of this, this zeitgeist. It, you know, it, 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 um, its um, problems and then its successes um, illustrate many of these features. And, and I think um, the, the success of OpenStack, especially now that, that there's been this, this really nice transition from management by Rackspace to the, to the foundation, uh, is really a model for, um, for future projects that are, you know, have a similar kind of level of interest and level of participation by commercial entities. That, that, that this, this, um, this is really the right way to do things, I think, going forward. I mean, I don't know if we want to have tons and tons of uh, projects with foundations. I mean, that, that, that's, that's something in a sense we're, we're, we've been trying to move away from, this, this kind of uh, uh, abundance of foundations. But I think the, the idea of, um, uh, you know, attracting co diverse corporate and commercial interests to a project um, developing a kind of very healthy ecosystem with established companies and, and startup companies, and then making sure that uh, that there aren't uh, unchecked imbalances of power within the project, that there isn't undue influence by any one company, whether that's through licensing or through through um, corporate governance uh, uh, means, that, that this is really the, the, the right approach for a project of this importance and this sort of scope. And uh, yeah, that that is... So thank you very much. Questions? I've been sort of skeptical of that. I've given some talks on that subject, but I do think that it is, I mean, just based on what I see and what I see actually going on inside Red Hat and actually in my own head, I see I see some validity to this, at least for projects that are launched by corporations. I think that there's definitely that kind of trend going on. Actually, Mark influenced a lot of people, so that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. standpoint of licensing you mean yeah I mean I have thought about like for example WordPress and, and Drupal I I think they come from an earlier era I mean that's that's basically my 
Well, so 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 my view is that I've seen open open core sort of lost meaning uh, once it became kind of a controversial issue, and I mean recently um, I don't think Sean Kerner Kerner is in the room, but he was um, he was here for some of the early earlier sessions. He wrote an article recently, um, sort of I think it was a plea to the OpenStack Foundation board not to make OpenStack open core, and and so that kind of I don't I don't kind of accept that definition of. Uh, of open core. So, so to me, the, the key thing about open core is this kind of um, lack of equality or fairness so that, that one company, uh, the, the business model is structured so that one company can use, the G, can use both the GPL and a proprietary license, much like traditional dual licensing business models. And everyone else is, is stuck with the GPL. And I don't think that the, the same um, problems that result from that exist when the open source project is under a permissive license. I think that's kind of a uh, I, I'm not. Uh, this is not an insight that I came up with, but I've I've heard other people express it this way, and I think that it's that there's there's a lot of truth to that. That the, the the thing about permissive licensing is that that every participant has the equal right to proprietize. So no one monopolizes the right to proprietize, and I think that's what keeps it, in my mind, from being um, at least the same kind of open core. Maybe it's a different kind of open core that's sort of a benevolent open. Oh yeah, so so yeah, that, that that's yeah, that, that's sort of essential to the model that that there's one that IP or copyright is flowing inbound to one entity, and so only that entity gets the right to um, be able to both you know license software under the GPL to others and license a proprietary version to others. Everyone else is stuck with using the GPL, and that creates a kind of uh, imbalance of power. As, as, so it's sort of an, I see it as an abuse of the, of the GPL. Uh, uh, Loic, who's in the back of the room, gave a talk at FOSDEM uh, earlier this year um, about GPL enforcement. And the, the question was, you know, whether, is, it, is it ever, um, I forget how, what, the, what the title of the talk was, but it was a very good title, something like, um, can a corporation enforce the GPL without being corrupt like, <laughs> like MySQL? And that, that's like the best title ever, ever devised for any talk. But that's kind of expresses, expresses my view on the subject. That it's sort of, there's a kind of corruption that occurs when you have uh, this, these kinds of business models that make, that really perversely use, it's almost like, like taking the idea behind copyleft and then doing a, which is it's described as a jujitsu move and then doing a jujitsu move on copyleft. So, so kind of using copyleft as a, as a means of developing a proprietary software business model. That's very interesting. 
Right. I think that the, the problem is uh, that seems to occur is that when when new projects are started by corporations, m most of the copyright is going to be controlled by the corporation, even if they don't use um, these kinds of legal mechanisms to keep control. And uh, and and it's some, sometimes it's an appearance of a problem. You know, I, I think I've I've thought about this. You know, with with Red Hat because we we basically do not use use these these CLAs or, or copyright design. And that is something that that I have I have tried to make sure that we we largely stick away from. I mean, we, we, we do for legacy reasons in some cases, but but still, I, I, I imagine that there's there's this signaling that goes on when, when when Red Hat uses the GPL. You know, do do external participants think ah Red Hat is is uh, trying to game the system the way so many other companies have? And so, you know, that that's that's something that I've thought about. 